In 2020, during the greatest year of all of our lives, Elizabeth Brunick, who's a Christian opinion writer at the New York Times, tweeted this. There's just something unsustainable about an environment that demands constant atonement, but actively disdains the very idea of forgiveness. There's just something unsustainable about an environment that demands constant atonement, but actively disdains the very idea of forgiveness. And she was reflecting on what American culture has become, a culture of outrage that demands atonement for every wrong, past and present, every transgression, every microaggression, and even the slightest of offenses. It's constantly looking for where to place the next scarlet letter. And we've come to a place culturally where being a victim has, in a sense, become its own form of virtue, which just implies that in order then to be virtuous, you must look for transgressors. And when the wrong is discovered, even if an apology is offered, it's just never seemingly good enough. She says this is unsustainable and it's self-defeating. Why? Well, it's a culture that wants change. And so atonement is demanded. But the problem is that absolution is never granted. Which means that there's no real impetus for someone to change. Why? Because no matter what you do, your identity will always be based upon your worst failures and faults. And there's nothing that pushes back against an angry, outraged culture like the word forgiveness. Because forgiveness is something different. Forgiveness is the willingness to see that someone actually never can truly atone for their wrongs. Forgiveness is willing to offer someone a second chance It's willing to offer someone an identity that's not based on their worst failures and faults and mistakes. Forgiveness allows there to be room for someone despite what they've done. And that's why our culture disdains forgiveness, because our culture is not looking for restoration and reconciliation. It's looking for retribution. And, of course, you know, the irony of it all is that just as soon as Elizabeth Brunig hit send on that tweet, it was deleted shortly after. She received an avalanche of outrage and how dare yous for suggesting that forgiveness could be part of what heals our social ills. And the responses just came in hot and heavy. They essentially all said the same things. Forgiveness is the denial of justice. Forgiveness perpetuates injustice. Forgiveness lets perpetrators off the hook. But most of all, forgiveness was wrong. Because forgiveness places a burden on the victim. And to that part, I would say yes. It absolutely 100% does. Forgiveness isn't free. It is so very costly. Forgiveness is deeply sacrificial. And it's a sacrifice that only victims can make. And our, dis- our culture disdains forgiveness, but if we step back for a second, we'd realize this isn't anything new. It's quite normal, in fact, because forgiveness is not natural to us. And nowhere in antiquity or in history was there ever any civilization or culture where forgiveness was at the heart of their cultural values. History has disdained forgiveness just as much as our present day. So if that's true, then where did our ideas about forgiveness come from? 
It was Jesus. It was Jesus. It was Jesus who introduced forgiveness onto the world stage in a way that nobody else had ever done. It was Jesus who talked about forgiveness in the most radical and revolutionary ways. He comes along and he tells these parables of forgiveness to describe not this world but another world. Forgiveness parables to tell us what the kingdom of God was like. And he taught us uncomfortable truths like if you forgive others their sin against you, your Father in heaven will forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins against you, your Father in heaven will not forgive you. He said, turn the other cheek. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And when Peter asked Jesus if he should forgive someone who had sinned against him seven times, Jesus says, no. Forgive him 77 times. Nobody in history talked like that. Nobody in history ever has. Nobody talked about forgiveness like Jesus. And in the Great Commission, Jesus said, Forgiveness, forgiveness of sins must be preached to all nations. Now go, go into all of the world for the life of the world. And it was the church that carried that radical, life-changing gospel of forgiveness to a world that has never heard anything like it. And yet we still live in a world that doesn't value forgiveness. The same one he sent his disciples into. And it's a world that so desperately needs to hear forgiveness. But as Christians, we have to be careful Because we can either be shaped by our culture or we can be shaped by our Christian values. We can be shaped by the values of our culture in a way where we don't really value forgiveness either. And we can forget how central forgiveness is to the heart of our faith. We can forget that forgiveness is supposed to actually shape how we live. We can treat forgiveness like it's a secondary feature of the gospel and not the very foundation of it. So honestly, when was the last time you felt forgiven? When was the last time you pushed through that difficult work and you struggled to say to that other person, I forgive you? When was the last time you thought about forgiveness at all? And today we're beginning a new sermon series on forgiveness. Because we want to be reawakened to the beauty and the power and the centrality of forgiveness in our faith. To remember how life-changing it is. To be moved by it once again. And we want you to hear Jesus say to you, your sins are forgiven. And for you to hear it as though it were the first time. And so in this series, you're going to be challenged. You're going to be challenged to actually receive forgiveness. To stop trying to atone for your sins. To stop trying to set yourself free. But you're also going to be challenged to forgive. And to say those three so difficult words, I forgive you. Because those two realities go hand in hand. And you can't have one without the other. And our first passage this morning is the well-known story about the paralytic who was lowered down through the roof. I remember the first time I heard it was on a felt board in Sunday school. And we probably first remember this story as one of Jesus' healing miracles, which it certainly is. But the healing is actually not the point of the story. Jesus even says so himself. The first thing he says to this paralytic is, your sins are forgiven. 
Your sins are forgiven. And when the scribes and the Pharisees hear that, they get all hot underneath the collar. They get wrapped around the axle. They don't like hearing that. They're bothered by it, and they disdain the very thought of it. And Jesus knows exactly what they're thinking. And so then he turns to them and he asks, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or rise, pick up your bed and walk? And he knows what they're thinking. He knows they're thinking it's far easier to say your sins are forgiven. Because how is anybody even able to measure whether or not that even happened? Any crazy fool can come along and say, your sins are forgiven. But to say, pick up your bed and walk, well, that's different. That is you putting all the chips in the center. That's something you can see. That's something you can verify. That's power. So Jesus says to them, so that you would know that I have the power to forgive sins. He looks at the paralytic and he says, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. Can you imagine the chill that everyone felt when they saw this man's legs healed right before their eyes? But that's actually the distracting part. Because the real question is, what did they do with their sins? Because this isn't a healing story. This is a forgiveness story. And it reminds us how forgiveness is at the heart of Jesus' ministry, but it also shows us how radical his forgiveness truly is. Because do you know, do you remember, do you want to see again what you have been given? So let's start by putting you in this story. Imagine you are this paralytic. And in the ancient world, that means that each day you're carried out to the streets. You're placed on a street corner with all the other lepers and all the other cripples and outcasts. And that's where you will beg all day long, hoping to receive a little financial pity from those who are passing by. But you live in complete and utter shame. You can't control yourself. You can't do anything for yourself. And all those people that pass by you each and every day mostly assume that you are paralyzed because you are a sinner that is receiving judgment from God. So why would they help you? That's your world. That's your life. You are a disgraced, marginalized nobody. But then one day your friends run up to you in the middle of the day. Before you have time to even ask what's going on or think about what's happening, they pick you up on your bed and they start running you down the street as fast as they can go. And so you finally say, what are you doing? Where are you taking me? Where are we going? And they say, he's here. He's here. Jesus is here. And you've heard about this Jesus. His name had recently burst onto the scene because of all of these mighty works that he had been doing. He was casting out demons. He was healing the sick and lepers and cripples. And he had come to your town. So as they hoof you down the street, huffing and puffing, you look down at your legs. And for the first time in your life, you feel hope. You feel real hope. But when you get where Jesus is, you can't get in. It's standing room only. But your friends won't be denied. So they push through the crowds. They carry you up the steps around the back of the house, through the gate. They crawl all the way up. They set you down, and they start pulling back the tiles of the roof one at a time. But now they're being so disruptive that Everything is stopped, and you can hear all the people inside getting angry and yelling up to stop. And it's all quite very humiliating, but you live in shame. And so what do you have left to lose? And so they finish. They grab you. They lower you through the hole all the way down to the floor. You look up, and there's Jesus, and he's looking right at you. 
Then he looks up at your friends. And then he looks back down at you. And he says, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. I bet that kind of feels a little anticlimactic, doesn't it? It's not what you expect Jesus to say. I don't think it's what this paralytic or his friends expected Jesus to say either. You have to think this paralytic heard Jesus say, your sins are forgiven, and then he's sitting there thinking, okay, and? Anything else you want to tell me? But no, that's it. Just forgiveness. He healed so many other people. So why would he overlook this man's glaringly obvious need for healing and say, your sins are forgiven? And perhaps this paralytic man just ended up thinking, thanks. But that's not why I came. I think you know what that feels like. It's that tension where forgiveness just doesn't quite feel like enough. Yes, Jesus died on the cross. Yes, there is forgiveness from my sin. Such a great gift. But Jesus, I really, really want you to fix this more than anything else. I want you to heal my body. I want you to heal my husband, my wife, my child, my loved one. I really want you to fix this situation that I've lived with for so long, this situation that surprised me. Do you not see me sitting here helpless in front of you? Let's be honest, the forgiveness that we have received can so quickly take a back seat and we come to Jesus with all those things that we want him to fix. We can focus on that gift that we haven't received yet. We can come to this table every week that says to you, your sins are forgiven. This table that says to you, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you've done, your sins are forgiven. And yet in the back of our mind, God feels distant and cold. You feel unseen as though he's overlooking your glaringly obvious need. And so when you hear your sins are forgiven, you can think the exact same thing. Thanks. But that's not why I came. And the story occurs at the very beginning of Mark because he wants to immediately confront our motives for coming to Jesus. If you follow Jesus for five minutes, you will recognize that sooner or later you're going to find out that his priorities do not always match yours. And that is a painful place. And Mark is saying to you, why are you coming to Jesus? I want to tell you why he came to you. Because when Jesus says to this man, your sins are forgiven, you see what he's doing. You see what he's doing. Jesus is putting his cards on the table. He's showing his hands. Jesus is giving this man what he needs far more than two working legs. He is giving this man peace with God. This paralyzed man and his friends wanted healing. They wanted a good thing. But the hard reality is that they wanted something and they were only looking on the surface. But Jesus was looking down into this man's soul. And he met him in his deepest, most existential need. Jesus didn't come to give you new legs. Jesus came to give you new life. 
And so when Jesus says your sins are forgiven and that man sitting there thinking, it's not why I came, Jesus is saying, no, it's why I came. This is exactly why I came, so that you might have your sins forgiven and you might have peace with God. This isn't new. This is exactly what Mark tells us from the very start. He opens his gospel telling us about John the Baptist who prepared the way of the Lord. And how did he do it? He called people to repentance. And people were going out to him left and right. Crowds and the mass is going out to be baptized by him and they were confessing their sins. And John would tell them, there is one coming after me who is mightier than I and I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. So make yourself ready for his coming. Prepare your heart by having your sins on the tip of your tongue so that you will be ready for what he is going to introduce into this world. You can have forgiveness. You can have peace with God. And we can so easily forget the significance of what that forgiveness really means. And maybe it's easier to remember what it means if we consider what it meant for this paralytic. Because if Jesus doesn't say to him, your sins are forgiven, then it means that even though he's a paralytic, in light of eternity, his existence is as good as it will ever get. In light of eternity, without forgiveness of his sins, it means he's living his best life now, even with those paralyzed legs. Without peace with God, he will spend eternity thinking back to those good old days when at least he could sit there on the street corner and feel the warm sun on his face. When he could watch the sunrise in the morning when everything around him was quiet. At least he could feel the gentle breeze on his face or listen to the rain. At least then he could watch as people walked by and hear the laughter of children. But now all that's been swallowed up by the unending loneliness and torment and darkness of an eternity without forgiveness and peace with God. And in that place, he will bear the eternal regret of thinking Only I had asked for forgiveness. I wasn't just paralyzed, I was blind. I couldn't see who was right in front of me. If only I could go back to that moment, I would have confessed my sins. I would have cast my face at his feet. I would have begged him for his mercy and forgiveness. But in that place, the only answer he'd receive is the lonely echo of his own voice, darkness without end. But that isn't what happened. That is not this man's story. Why? Because Jesus said to him, your sins are forgiven. You have peace with God. You have peace with me. Christian, no matter what's going on in your life, the greatest gift that you will ever possess is that you have peace with God. And just to state the obvious, did you notice that this man never even asked for forgiveness? He never asked for it. No confession, no repentance, no recognition of sins. He actually comes looking for something else. But Jesus forgives him anyways. And it's in the unexpectedness of this moment that, yes, it reveals Jesus' priorities. He came for the forgiveness of sins. But this moment also shows how radical his forgiveness really is. This man never repents, but Jesus forgives him anyways. Why? First, it's because Jesus is God. That's what God promised to do. That's what God does. Jesus is not generic G-O-D God. Jesus is the Old Testament God. He is the one who said he is sovereign over salvation. He is the one who told Moses, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. 
I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. I will forgive transgression and sins, but I will by no means clear the guilty. This story is Jesus being gracious to whom he will be gracious, showing mercy to whom he will show mercy. It's what Paul tells us about salvation, that God is the sovereign initiator. He is the sovereign giver of salvation. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. And that forgiveness reminds us that God chose us long before we ever chose him. And this man's forgiveness in this moment is because that forgiveness has finally caught up to him in space and time. That he was always in the bullseye of his Savior and his God. And look, I get it. I know that a typical response to the idea of God being sovereign over salvation is like, It just feels so arbitrary. Just the randomness of God choosing to forgive some and not others seems so impersonal and cold. Like a cosmic judge just playing a game of salvation roulette. And sure, I'll meet you there. And I'll say yes, it certainly can. But only if you stop there. And only if you ignore the rest of this story. Because what does the rest of this story tell you about who Jesus is and the beauty of his forgiveness? What was it in this story that actually motivated Jesus to forgive this man's sins? It wasn't the the paralytic. Was it just a cosmic coin flip? Or was it something more? It says that when the friends lowered the paralytic down, Jesus looked up at them. And it says when he saw Their faith, not the faith of the paralytic man, but the faith of his friends. It was when Jesus saw their faith that he then looked down to the paralytic and he said, your sins are forgiven. That is hardly random and cold. That is God being moved by the simple faith of this man's friends. Sure, they didn't have all their theological, spiritual priorities in perfect order. They came with all they had. They came with all they needed, just the simple recognition that they needed Jesus. And Jesus was moved by their desperation. He's moved by their love for their friend. He's moved by their hope that he could actually do something. He's moved by their faith of how much they needed him to intervene into their story. You know what that means? It means that Jesus hears your prayers for your child who's grown and walked away from the faith. It means he's moved by your prayers for your little ones that haven't yet embraced it. It means he's moved by your prayers for your husband, your wife, your children, your son-in-law, your daughter-in-law, your neighbor, and your friend. Because he is the God who said, I delight in showing mercy, and I will cast your sins into the heart of the sea. He's the God who says, I myself will blot out your transgressions and remember your sins no more. He's the God who swerves to show compassion. He jumps to give his mercy, and he's come to offer you forgiveness so that you might have peace with God. This man being forgiven is because Jesus came to make good on his promises. And the fact that this paralytic never even asked for forgiveness, yet he received it anyway, it actually shows us the depths of God's forgiveness, not just towards him, but towards us. Why? Are you and I really that much different than this paralytic? Are we really so different than he? When you confess, do you really understand the full depths of your sin? When you confess your sins, have you really plumbed the depths of how deep it goes? Have you really understood all the consequences of what you've done? 
When you confess your sins, do you really know how much damage your anger has caused or how much your lust has destroyed? Is your confession attended with a full comprehension of the full scope of your addiction in the wake of all of its destruction? Do you look at the cross and think, yes, that is exactly what my sins deserve? Really, in the end, is your confession of your sins any more complete than this man's? No. But you are forgiven anyways. Because you had those moments where all you had was the realization that you needed him. And he was faithful to give you what you needed. Even when you couldn't see it for yourself. And this story reminds us of the great scandal of Christ's forgiveness and how radical it truly is. Because he actually forgives us when we will never, ever really know how much we've done. He forgives us when we will never fully know how much we need it. He came offering peace and forgiveness to those who would never fully understand what they've done. And so how could we possibly atone for it? But Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. Because I will make atonement for you. And I will forgive you when you will never know how much that atonement cost me. Even as Christians, we can look just like the surrounding world, where when we're wronged, all we want is atonement. We want the other to pay. We want the other who betrayed us and broke us and disregarded us and belittled us to know all of the damage that they've done from top to bottom, to realize what they did, to pay back everything that they stole, to give back everything that they took. And then, maybe then, they might be worthy of our forgiveness. But Jesus came to those who have forgotten far more sins than they will ever confess. Jesus came to those whose repentance is so imperfect and incomplete. He came with forgiveness to offer it to those who would say, yes, thank you for that forgiveness, but what you've given me isn't enough. I want more. I doubt your goodness unless I have it. He comes to those who have no idea how much pain they caused them, and honestly, we never will. And yet he still comes offering his body and his blood to make atonement for us. Do you know what it's like to be whipped for the sake of the one who abused you? Do you know what it's like to be tortured for the sake of the one who betrayed you? Do you know what it's like to be crucified for the one who hated you and rejected you? Do you know what it's like to be crucified for the one who will disregard your crucifixion over and over and over again and still say, I forgive you? You have peace with me. Christian, Jesus' forgiveness towards you runs far deeper than your awareness of how much you need it. And we're not these Jesus' very words when he's hanging on the cross and he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Christian, your sins are forgiven. So what are you to do with all that? As we enter into this new series, I want to leave you with a few challenges for what all this might mean for you along the way. First is that I know some of you are praying for that healing. You're praying for a good thing. You should pray for it. You pray for it because there's something that you want Jesus to fix, but that healing hasn't come. And today, forgiveness just doesn't feel like enough. 
and you feel overlooked. You feel unseen and you feel paralyzed in your need. What if all of this paralytic's pain and suffering and sorrow was for the simple purpose of leading to an encounter with Jesus? And what if the same is true of all of yours? I pray that you would know peace with God. Secondly, some of you need to stop trying to atone. I invite you to stop trying to atone for your sins. Stop beating yourself up all the time as if Jesus is only happy as long as you think of yourself as just a wretched little worm and you constantly degrade yourself. Quit putting Jesus back on the cross with those thoughts. (laughs) Stop trying to measure up. Stop trying to balance everything out. Put down the whip. If you can't remember all of your sins, then how could you possibly atone for them? Maybe you hear Christ saying your sins are forgiveness and that forgiveness towards you, and you recoil. It's so hard to receive because you continue to say, no, that's not possible. Do you know who that sounds like? It sounds like the scribes and Pharisees that scoffed when they heard it. I pray that you will finally receive forgiveness. Thirdly, others of you need to forgive. Who you need to forgive, I do not know. But you do. And it's time. Hasn't the root of bitterness and anger and unforgiveness imprisoned you for far too long? Will you stop drinking the poison It's time to let go. It's time to be set free. Because, friend, they can never atone for what they did to you. And the choice is before you to either have an identity that's based on what's been done to you, or you can have an identity that's based on what has been done for you. And I pray that you will come to know the power of forgiveness. And lastly, some of you perhaps aren't yet believers. And you haven't trusted in Christ yet. Maybe you feel like there's a part of you where maybe he's after you. In some strange manner, he has come to your town. But you struggle with it because you feel like you've done things in your past that can't be forgiven. And it's scary because you know that following him means that you're going to have to let some things go. Things that you feel like you can't live without. But what if this whole time your life has actually been nothing more than living like a paralytic? What if Jesus could give you new legs that can follow after him? What if new life really was possible? I pray that you would know the forgiveness that is offered to you. And as we enter this series, might we all hear Jesus say to us, your sins are forgiven. And might we all hear it as though it were the first time. For the glory of Christ and the life of the world. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, We ask for your forgiveness. We ask that that forgiveness would be more real to us than it has ever been before. Remind us that you offer new identity through that forgiveness. You offer us new life. You offer us a new eternity. But all of that is only beautiful because through it you offer us yourself so that we might have peace with you. Would you reawaken us to the beauty of it? And would you change our lives with that beautiful truth once again? And we ask that you would meet us at your table, and that you would feed us unto everlasting life. We ask this for your glory and for our good. Amen.